Hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. I, it was wonderful. I learnt so much. Um, namely that redheads ought not to commit crimes because they have some very discerning features. Um, you, you, you used the phrase um, limits of science at one point and I was mulling that over because as you were talking it seemed to me science feels limitless in this domain. You're finding out so much and doing such extraordinary work. But when you were talking about the barley bomb and the, the, the victims who are misidentified, I thought... That's, that there is perhaps a limit of science insofar as some people don't want to be persuaded of the scientific data that you're unearthing. And there are all sorts of reasons why you might be resistance, resistant to that information. I could imagine Jake's mother being resistant to it or the, the, the mother of the, the young woman you talked about. In those circumstances, what do you do when the, the science isn't enough to persuade someone? Um. I can give you an example of a May. So we had uh, a young man whose microlite crashed off the east coast of Scotland. And this was in the days before DNA. And his body had been in the water for a couple of weeks. So when the body was washed on shore, um, it wasn't in a very good condition. Um, he was headless, he was handless, he was footless because the body had started to, to decompose. And we were asked to say, was there anything we could use to identify him? So he was male, we could tell his height, we could tell his, his, his um, ancestral origin. And it came down to a very simple thing, that we asked um, his girlfriend and his mother to describe if he had any birthmarks or, or anatomical marks and his mother said, my son was perfect. My son had no blemish. And his girlfriend said, he's got a birthmark underneath his left nipple. So that's very useful. So we have a look underneath his left nipple and we find a birthmark. So the girlfriend knew his anatomy more intimately than did his mother. But the result was, whilst the girlfriend accepted it was him, the mother never did. She never, ever accepted that it was him. Nowadays, we'd have more more substantial evidence to be able to support it, obviously, but then we couldn't. But the Bali bombing is the same, so that you will have people who will, who will go out to that part of the world after a disaster, desperate to find somebody to bring home, but others who are equally desperate not to find who they're looking for. And it becomes such a personal thing that all you can do is lay the information to them as you have it at the time. If it changes, you go back. But at the moment, you can say, to the best of our ability, we believe it is or is not your loved one. And it comes down to conversation, and it comes down to trust, and it comes down to acceptance. Because whilst we can 100% exclude identity, we cannot 100% confirm it. So if you imagine that there were several children from a family lost, in terms of skeletal remains, and we had it within Kosovo, then you would, all the DNA would tell you is those people belong to that family, but it wouldn't tell you necessarily which of the members of the family it was, unless you had personal DNA for them, which in those cases we didn't. So it is about trying to be honest, always trying to be honest, and always trying to give as much information as you can, but never going too far. And it just does come down to personal acceptance. Thank you. There's a question on this side. Dim, so thank you very much for a deeply moving lecture. It's, it's an absolute honor to be with you in, in one room, and I've, I've hoped for that since I read that article in Wired about your work in catching pedophiles thank a year you. or two ago. And I did read about the case of a dismissed teenager case, and it upset me greatly, but I also read about some monsters that you helped convict. And ever since then, I was thinking as to whether technology can assist and sort of automate that. So. It's very uplifting that you thought of it as well and um, that you're developing something. So I have two questions. Is the end goal of the technology you're working to develop to automate the process of identification so that it can be scaled? Because you're just one person and your team is small, as I read, and I can't even begin to imagine the kind of trauma that on any person, up to and including police officers, seeing the images of an abused two-year-old must inflict. I mean that's beyond my comprehension, I think everyone else's. So my first question is, is the end game to make it really automatic so that you can really unleash it on all these millions of images? 
And the second one, it's sort of maybe semi-opportunistic, hopefully from your perspective, because you know the technology is developing greatly and we're talking ultimately about pattern recognition. So this is where the yeah. modern artificial intelligence technologies are getting really, really good. And frankly, I think that if you approach one of the technology giants, they would be willing and helpful because there's no better use for this technology ever than catching child molesters. Yeah. So have you considered that? So um, on a number of fronts. So first of all, the technology for us is about getting to the point that, that we can process many more cases than we can currently do. Um, but it is making sure that it's scientifically robust. So for us, it's about doing the research first before we're ready to implement it. And with large companies, best one in the world, then often the drive may well be commercial rather than necessarily being societal. So we want to make sure the science is right before we do it. What the technology will also do is help those officers, and I don't know how they do it, but that is their job, is to sit and look at those images day in and day out. And there is a real toll and a price to pay for them doing it. We do it on an odd occasion. They do it all day and every day. And I think in some ways they are the modern sin eaters. They're, they're, they're eating the sins of other people so they don't have to do it. It's a really horrendous job. So yes, we want to be able to, to safeguard them, but we want to be able to make sure that the technology is out there to get to those cases that we just simply can't at the moment. But one of the things I did in the Wired Live that you talked about was I, I put out a challenge to industry that said there must be a way in which you can recognize in a photograph whether the individual is clothed or unclothed, an adult or a child. There must be a way in terms of technology that you can stop these images, maybe not from being taken, but certainly from being transferred. And I can't believe that, that technology won't get so smart that we can get to a point where we can actually start to remove these. But much of them are on the dark web. And so it's about being able to get into that sort of area as well. And, and you know, with, I can't really be more honest about it. It is a crime that has probably existed since man first began. And I don't think it's a crime that we will ever lose. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep trying to cut off as many heads of the hydra as we possibly can, but we may not kill the beast. And so technology unquestionably has its role to play right the way across the board. So, so I was thinking about um, like an evolutionary arms race, if you like, and uh, how your technologies can um, uh, help convict on the, the, the images that are already out there. But as kind of paedophiles get more clever and more um, used to knowing that this is out there to convict them, won't they just start hiding their hands or wearing gloves? Or I mean, it, it's, it's going to be a point where they're... Where the technology won't... It's a very good question. It's one that's asked of us frequently, is that when, when you convey this information, aren't you telling people how not to do something? And we see no evidence of a reduction in the cases that come to us. We see no evidence of anybody wearing gloves. And you have to bear in mind the crime is a tactile crime, and therefore wearing gloves is a barrier towards the tactile crime. Most people don't believe they're going to be caught, because it's on their own phones, it's on their own computers. And so there is an element of, of not believing that you're actually vulnerable as somebody who's going to be found guilty of the crime. So we all know that DNA survives, but to be honest, most criminals still don't think about it, which is why we still capture them. So even though the technology gets out there, fortunately, most criminals are not very smart. Thank you. About 40 years ago, I had my palm read, and uh, I was told I wasn't going to live all that long, you know, not uh, hugely, and I wasn't going to be rich and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, and I photographed my palms, and I saw them just the other day, and they did appear to have changed a bit, but not significantly. Mm. Is that what you would expect? Yes. So um, the, the palm creases form um, as a result of the positioning of bones. So when the joints are formed in the individual um, areas of the hand, these skin creases are just allowing movement. And once that skin crease is formed, it, it really doesn't change very much. 
And what will happen is that if, if you're a, a bricklayer, for example, or you're someone who, who has a lot of exposure to the outside world, often you find that sometimes they can get worn away so that fingerprints and, and palm lines can actually wear away with age. And it's quite difficult sometimes to get fingerprints from elderly individuals for that reason. So environment will, will affect it, but the inherent pattern doesn't change very much. Um, but if I was looking at it correctly, my lifeline did seem to have increased. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I won't ask about your love life either. <laughs> Um, so there's a question and a lady in just dead set in the middle there, please. Um, you were when you were talking about Jake, one of the basic things that you could tell from the skeleton was that he was Caucasian. I just wondered how. So um, we're not very good at determining ancestral origin from human remains, but the area that is, is most, has most information for us is in the skull, and it's mainly associated with the teeth and with the palate. So, for example, Caucasian tend to have not a very wide palate. Um, the teeth tend to be a bit more crowded and tend to be a bit more small. When you look to individuals whose um, ancestral origin is, is sub-Saharan Africa, you tend to have a much wider palate, you tend to have larger teeth, and the, the teeth actually fit within the palate. If you go into um, groups, for example, that are further east, you get a particular shape sometimes of the central incisors. So it's mainly about changes associated with, with teeth, jaws, and face, rather than necessarily about skull. And you, know, you, you can see that when you look at individuals in the very widest sense of an ancestral origin, you can see characteristics within the face that are typical of those groups. But what it doesn't tell you is where somebody is born, but it does mean that it was unlikely that he was going to have an ancestry that was going to be sub-Saharan Africa or was going to be from the Far East or was going to be in, in the fourth group, which is the, the um, indigenous populations in the South Pacific. So those are the four groups that you can, to some extent, separate out, but not with any degree of certainty. So we have to be very careful when we give that information to the police that they say, well, what do you mean by Caucasian? And by Caucasian, we may well mean Indian subcontinent as well. Um, and it can be quite challenging for them because they want to be able to put out a particular descriptor. And what they really want to know from us is, is the person Polish? Or is the person, you know, and you go, we can't do that. We're good, but we're not that good. So it, it, it's one of the most difficult ones. Good evening. Good evening. Um, when you were doing your sort of summary of what things you did, you mentioned the word jigsaw puzzle, uh, and it struck me that jigsaw puzzle, there's two things. One, you know the pieces go in the puzzle, and two, you've got a picture. But in your case, you don't even know if all the pieces go together. How do you go about sorting it out? So you have an assumption, um, certainly in, in the case that we saw there, um, you have an assumption that it is probably from the one individual. It's difficult when you've got a mass fatality event. But if you, if you know, um, if you're looking at a skull, for example, that has mass fracturing, somebody's um, taken a hammer to it, so you've got all the pieces and you're trying to put them back together again, or you have um, ballistic damage associated with it, um, you're, you're pretty sure that it's one person, and you're pretty sure you know what a skull looks like. You just don't know quite what this one looks like but an orbital margin looks like an orbital margin, and a zygomatic bone looks like a zygomatic bone. And it is about recognizing the little patterns that are in the little pieces. So we, we had a murder in just north of Glasgow, and a fragment of bone was found in the filter of the washing machine um, because it had been on the perpetrator's jumper. And it was about four millimeters long and about two millimeters wide. And anatomically, it can only have come from one area, which was, which was the greater wing of the sphenoid, because the clues were there in the picture. So, so we do need to know what e every tiny little bit looks like, and we need to be able to identify them. We need to start gluing them together, um, but you don't ever glue it until you know it's a fit. Um, and once you've got a fit, it's about then trying to do a three-dimensional jigsaw, not a two-dimensional jigsaw. And it's, it's absolutely absorbing. It really is absorbing and very, very frustrating. And I can remember doing a case of, of uh, a young man whose, whose skull was very badly fractured. 
and we couldn't get any of the pieces to fit together. And the police were watching us and we could feel the sweat and we could feel the frustration. And then suddenly when you got one bit to fit, all the other bits would fit around it. And it is just persistence. It does come eventually if, if you've spent enough time. The best anthropologists are the old anthropologists. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry we've run out of uh, time for more questions. I know there was a couple more hands. Um, so um, I just finally just wanted to say that um, our new um, strategy is based on encouraging people to think more deeply about science and its place in our lives. And the two things are more deeply and place of science in our lives. And I, and I really think that Sue's lecture this evening has been a real embodiment of that. So thank you so much, Sue, for coming oh, thank here you. and sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you.